People are already aware of myriapods, or at least I hope so. They are long and they have many legs. Pretty sure most people have heard of the name millipede and centipede, but there are other myriapods aside from those two, the symphila and pauropoda. However, this is not it. This one is an imposter. It's a velvet worm. So, let me bring up the question. What exactly is velvet worm? Like I hinted earlier, even though velvet worm kinda looks like myriapods, they are not myriapods. They are not even an arthropod. They are not a worm either. They are their own villain, Onychophora. Onychophora basically means carrier of claws. Well, perhaps bearer of claws sounds... cooler? Yeah, let's go with that. Anyway, they are divided into two families. Peripatopsidae, which is generally shorter with fewer legs, and Peripatidae, which is the opposite. Peripatopsidae is sometimes known as the southern velvet worms, because they can be found towards the south, mostly in Australia, but also towards New Guinea and the islands around it, South Africa, and Chile. Peripatidae can mostly be found in Central America, including the Caribbeans and Southeast Asia. However, they can also be found in Gabon and Northeast India, which is quite interesting to have such a fragmented distribution. But yeah, even though there are over 100 species of velvet worm, not a lot of people know them because their distribution is quite limited. Like I said earlier, Velvet worms are not arthropod, which means their legs are not segmented. However, their body is still segmented, even though there is no apparent segmentation on the surface. Their body is almost cylindrical, but it's slightly flattened. They have many stubby legs, which are usually called oncopod, but sometimes also called lobopod. These oncopods don't have any joint. Even though their legs look stubby, each of these legs are equipped with retractable claws, hence their scientific name, Onychophora, bearer of claws. They have a pair of antennae on their head. Behind those antennae, they have a pair of small and simple eyes. They also have mouth, which is perhaps obvious, but this lip surrounding their oral cavity is actually a muscular outgrowth of their throat, which is quite unique. Their mouth is usually called labrum, which is the same name as arthropod's mouth part. However, the structures and ontogeny of these two are completely different. Inside this cavity, there is a pair of mandibles that they use to puncture their prey. Functionally, it's similar to the chelicerae of chelicerate. On the side of their head, there is a pair of oral papillae. These papillae contain slime gland, which I will talk about in the lifestyle and behavior section. Unlike arthropods, they don't have exoskeleton. Their body are filled with hydrostatic fluid, which, in a sense, is their physical protection. In that way, they are quite similar to worms. Their size and number of legs varies between species. O. peripatellus nanus, which is the smallest known velvet worm, is only 1 cm with 13 pair of legs. The biggest velvet worm that we currently know is Monge peripatus solorzanoi which can grow up to 22 cm. Males of this species have 34 pairs of legs, while females have up to 41 pairs. If you have been paying attention to the previous section, you should be able to guess that these two belong in a different family. Oh by the way, the condition where females have more legs than males occur in many species. Females are also generally bigger than males. Now, let's talk about their lifestyle and behavior. But before that, velvet worms are generally cryptic and not easily seen. They prefer humid forests, especially rainforests. They are generally known to be a nocturnal predator. They eat any small invertebrates they can find. When they locate prey, they will shoot a slime jet from their papillae like I hinted earlier. This slime jet is not a direct and precise shot. Their slime jet oscillates significantly, so they cover a certain area. Prey will be entangled by the slime. Then they will approach and pierce them with their jaw. They mostly detect stuff with their antennae, but their eyes are still functional albeit not that good. They move relatively slowly. They crawl forward with their legs. 
Their claws help them traverse both rough and soft terrains. However, unlike myriapods, most of the forward movements are achieved by their body contraction, just like worms, basically. Some of them are known to be social, forming groups of up to 15 individuals. They reproduce sexually, and that's the only general remarks I could give about their reproduction. Why? Because their reproduction varies a lot between groups. I mean, it's understandable. After all, Felfot Worm is an entire film. Some of them are viviparous, some are oviparous, and some are ovoviviparous. One of them, which is Epiperipatus imterni, is known to be parthenogenic. There is no record of male on this species, so they could potentially be a female-only species. Their fertilization is generally internal. Males usually transfer sperm through spermatophores. They put their spermatophores on their head and push it into the females. Records of some species stated they put the spermatophores on the female's back. Then the sperms will be absorbed through the skin and carried by the blood into the ovaries. Paraperipatus is also known to have a true penis, or at least a penis-like organ, so they most likely use this to copulate. Okay, so, we do know they have multiple reproductive modes and methods, so you might think we know a lot about them. However, as far as I know, actual documentations of their reproductions are scarce, which is why we don't have any videos or even images of them mating. Oh, and also, our knowledge of their reproduction is mostly based on few species. So yeah, basically our knowledge is just the bare minimum. What's funny is, even though we don't know much about their life history, we do have some fossil records. Or do we? I'm not sure. We do have several fossils that could potentially be velvet worms. However, we are not 100% sure. Those fossils could just be something related to velvet worms, but not necessarily be Onychophora. These fossils are usually just called Lobopodians. This includes the famous Hallucigenia, by the way, which, if you know the history of how we reconstruct Hallucigenia, you should understand how confusing this could be. Hallucigenia is also a lobopodian, but it's not similar enough to the velvet worms, so we don't consider them onychophoran. Some fossils are similar enough, though. For example, Helenodora inopinata from the Mason Creek of USA, and Antenipatus monsuensis from the Monsulemin of France, which I'm not sure how to pronounce, so I apologize if I butchered that. I would also like to point out that those two fossils do not overlap with the current distribution of Onychophora. That would mean Onychophora was more widespread and perhaps more abundant in the past. As you can see, talking about them in general is quite difficult because First of all, they are film level, and second of all, we don't have that much data of them. As time goes by, we most likely will discover something new about them, which would most likely be species specific, or at least group specific. This video serves as a generic introduction, and who knows, maybe with enough introduction, more people could be interested in these creatures, hence more research could be done perhaps by those people in the future. But for now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, I will be quite busy until early March, which means I won't be able to read comments. If you got any question or discussion, I would suggest joining our Discord server and ask them. Anyway, enjoy your day.